Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. I'm at the India International Center and with me is senior journalist Patricia Mukim. Patricia Mukim, she's the editor of the Shillong Times and she's been a journalist from 1987. She has traveled all across the northeastern part of India and she understands the complexities of the situation in Manipur. I'm going to talk to her only about Manipur, talk to her about what are the reasons why we've seen this terrible situation in Manipur from the 3rd of May. Patricia, thank you very much for giving us your time and the viewers of NewsClick. There are various descriptions being given to what has happened in Manipur in the last few months. Some people are calling it ethnic cleansing. Others have described it as a civil war. How would you describe what has happened in Manipur from early May? Well, see, the ethnic uh, tensions in all of the Northeast all of the northeastern states, which has about 238 ethnic communities, has always been there. Whether you look at Meghalaya, whether you look at uh, in Meghalaya today, you have Khasis and Garos not able to, you know, to resolve the issue of reservations. So similarly, in Manipur, it's a question of land, as everyone knows very well. The Maytes with the 53% population are restricted to the valley, which has only one tenth of the land surface of that state. The rest, 90% of the land is inhabited by the Kuki, Zhou, Chin people and, and the Nagas, the different Naga tribes. So there has always been this tension about uh, why should people, people who are indigenous to a state be considered residents of the hills and residents of the valleys. Moreover, people from the hills are able to buy land, property in the valley, but it's not the same for the people from the valley. They cannot buy land in the hills. So, I, and I think this came in with the British. You know, the British had this divide and rule policy, which they executed to perfection. Uh, in 1891, when they, they, they uh, captured the Kangla fort, the famous fort of the Manipur kings. And by 1907, they brought in this law which uh, separated the hills from the valleys. Perhaps uh, the British realized that the valley was fertile, they could get revenue from there, whereas the hills were completely, you know, jungle, undeveloped and uh, inhabited by people they would like to call in the savages. savages, yeah which is why they created they created the inner line permit so this is a british legacy which we never resolved when there was time and perhaps you know once we attained our independence there were there, there were too many fronts to deal with and uh, that little place called india's i call it india's northeast not northeast india didn't uh, really demand so much attention even when the Chinese came and attacked us in 1962, we were so ill-equipped to deal with that. So you can imagine the situation and they didn't also, the rulers, the new rulers of India didn't also understand the politics of the region. Okay, let me stop you here and go take a few steps back to what you had described. These numbers that you are giving us are all from the 2011 census yes, yes. because we haven't had a census after that mm -hmm. according to the 2011 census the total population of the state of manipur was around 28.55 lakhs yeah. now out of this about 53 percent are Métis, and they are in that in the valley. valley the imphal valley around the loktak lake mm -hmm. and 90 percent of the, the area land, the land. area of the state is occupied by roughly 43% of the population. There are 10 hill districts mm -hmm. and they are largely cookies and, and Nagas. Nagas. Let me ask you to talk a little bit about not just the ethnic aspect, but the religious aspect. Why? It is commonly known that the Metis are by and large 
Hindus, Vaishnavites. Vaishnavites. Mm -hmm. Whereas those who are in the hills, the Kukizos, the Nagas, a substantial proportion of them are They're Christians. all Christians. They're Christians. They're all, all Christians. Right. So the religious angle has also been highlighted in recent reports. How do you see the meshing or the interplay of the ethnic divide with the religious divide? Uh, because the number of churches burnt, there are almost about over 200 of them, many people would not like to look at this conflict in Manipur as a religious conflict or as a you know Hindutva-induced conflict. But considering that you have organizations like Mite Lipun, whose leader, Pramod Singh, was actually a BVP member in Gujarat, That's where he studied. That's a student swing of the Bharati Janta Party, huh, yeah. the Akhil Bharati yes, Vidyarthi yes. Parishad. And he was in Gujarat. He was in Gujarat. He, he became a member there. Then he came back and then uh, had his own gathers. And he very overtly says that he owes his loyalty to Biran Singh. He, Biran the Singh, chief the chief minister, like a hero to them. And, uh, you know, they have these arms training and all kinds of things. So we cannot rule out the religious angle completely. Yeah. So Patricia, the point I want to make, a lot of people, we are far away. And it's almost as if Manipur is a different part yes. of the world. Yes. A lot of people see that one of the important reasons why there was a sudden uh, and unexpected uh, conflict akin to a civil war, yeah, yeah. it was triggered off by a judgment of the High Court of Manipur on the 27th of March by Chief Justice M. V. Murli Dharan. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I've understood it correctly, he said that the government, the state government, should consider including the Metes and the list of tribes in the scheduled list of scheduled tribes mm -hmm. and that would naturally mean that they would get certain advantages uh, certain kinds of benefits which they were earlier not getting mm -hmm. what happened between the 27th of march when this judgment came and remember the judge said you consider it for inclusion and they i think they were given a deadline of july about, 27th yes yeah. what happened that resulted in this conflict violence erupting on the 3rd of May. What happened in between? Uh, I'd like you to explain this, please. This is uh, this High Court judgment, which many think is the trigger point, actually is only one of the triggers because there has already been a lot of uneasiness within the Biren Singh-led government, the BJP-led government in Manipur. There were a lot of dissensions. There were uh, there were a group of uh, Meite MLAs, BJP MLAs, who resigned their respective post, chairperson of the Manipur Tourism Corporation, state planning board, and so on and so forth. They were not happy, perhaps, uh, for not being included in the government. And their grouse is also that they were given those positions, but they weren't given you know, any work. So they felt quite worthless. Then again, there were those 12 Kuki MLAs who went to Delhi, camped there, and they were BJP. And they said that uh, we want a change of, uh, you know, a change of head of government. We want a change I, I of chief want minister. A different chief minister. Di different chief minister. And there are many reasons for that. Because before that, uh, this gentleman, Wang, Mr. Valte, who was, who was the chief minister's uh, advisor, when he went and met the chief minister on, on the 4th of May, I think, he was attacked very, very, I mean, he was tormented, he was electrocuted, and now he's in Delhi, he's a vegetable. He's that, in hospital. Over he's here, in hospital. At and, the All India Institute yes, of yes. Medical Sciences. So this man, at one point of time, had said that Biren Singh is our savior. And the reason is because Biren Singh had been tackling the drug uh, mafia. So the, this, he, this was a kooky gentleman saying, Biren Singh is our savior, you know, a messiah. So 
we don't really know what went wrong but in in the month of march again he, he was beaten up right there yes. in the heart of yes. Nepal he was pulled out the driver who was a mate was told to run away so he ran away for his life that man was tortured he almost died i mean they electrocuted him i don't know what all they used and you know there there have been a series of such violent attacks on that young uh, kuki a volunteer guard who was whose head was severed off his hands and his hands were cut his body was cut into pieces and then burnt and then you can literally see bones being collected and kept at one place the the cruelty is beyond description you know the cruelty inflicted on some of these cookies or people then the latest was when they killed that uh, lyricist and singer he was also a village volunteer he has five children he died uh, because of a, a bomb explosion and also because there was no ready uh, sort of assistance uh, health assistance there they had to take him all the way to mizoram he died on the way so uh, you know the the narrative of manipur is being created by both sides to show both as victims but i think we in the media need to be much more analytical okay i'm i'm going to come to the media and the role of the mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. but let me once again take a few steps back and look at the roots of the problem you said that the roots of the problem really began with the the british no there there i i also need to say this before i forget that in march again of this year biran singh suddenly cancelled the suspension of operation uh, agreement with the kuki militants uh, i mean no reasons were given for that and that created a lot of heartburn then uh, in in the valley you have meite militants these had not given up arms they were under no peace treaty but the armed forces special powers act was removed from large uh, several districts of manipur several police stations so they removed the, the armed the, forces special the, the powers act afswa yeah yes. afswa but they did not remove that in the hills even when the suspension of operations was there talks were going on they still didn't remove that from the hills okay I, i'm going to okay so since we are talking about this aspect of it let me continue may uh, ask you something that has happened which has never happened before mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, at yeah. least three thousand five hundred weapons yes. have been looted. They've been looted from the armed forces, from the paramilitary forces, from the police, the fr from armories. the armories. Yes. And this means that if so many weapons, including AK-47 yes. rifles, etc., yeah. are today in the hands of different kinds of people, mm -hmm. this has made the situation absolutely volatile. Yeah. absolutely yes in fact uh, general himalaya singh retired he had said that any any state or any country or any you know uh, community with so holding so many firearms with them there's bound to be conflict you cannot help that and the thing is the fact is that even until august the the arms looting was going on the uh, the report by this uh, group you know this this group had its journalists there for a long time and they were following this so even up to august arms were looted 45 uh, vehicles came and uh, looted the arms from the irb indian reserve battalion 2 uh, uh, armories and and they just went away there was no there was and no these resistance arms have not been recovered. no 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 some very few have been recovered but compared to the arms that More have been 3, looted yeah i mean no, i no no 3000 is a very decent number you you think it's more than 3000 i mean i have I've been reading much more than it's that it's 3500 or 3000 mm -hmm. but you say it could be more than yeah, that it's more than that because 3000 was at the first instance that mm -hmm. that was on may 4th when it happened in the armories or police armories and about 19 or about 35 police armories have been looted so this number is much more yeah 
much That's more. a very, very dangerous yes, situation. Yes. And they, they have not just uh, guns, but bombs and grenades and all kinds of things. Ammunition. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you to describe what is happening today in greater mm -hmm. detail, including what is happening in the relief camps, the whole issue of those ghastly videos yeah. that we showed. Uh, where women being stripped naked and gang raped. Mm -hmm. Before that, let me go back a little bit in time. I want you to explain a little bit. You said that many of the problems, the ethnic problems that we see in Manipur today is a legacy of the British, British. of the colonial rules, the inner line permit and so on. Mm -hmm. Manipur became an independent state in 1972. But before that, in 1960, there was a law which was called the Manipur Land Revenue and Land Reforms Act. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the issues that today have become huge about acquiring land, whether the valley people, mm -hmm. the Metis can acquire land uh, or buy land in the hills and vice versa, all these have their genesis to this law. Would you like to explain this a little bit, please? Yeah. So, uh, the hill people are very much against this law because they have their own traditional land ownership systems. Amongst the Kukis, the chiefs own land and the chiefs decide who they'll give land to, you know, to, amongst the community. So, uh, but what the, what the government at that time had said in 1960, is that if you do not bring the entire land of Manipur under a revenue system, then you will not even know how much land Manipur has because there's no cadastral survey. And uh, if you do not bring land under the revenue system, then the people in the hills cannot even get a bank loan because they can't mortgage their land. Land as a collateral is the normal thing. Whereas uh, the elite, the elite uh, amongst the tribals are able to buy revenue land in any part of Manipur. So they could, uh, you know, they actually had the advantage of being able to offer land as collateral, land building and everything. And in Manipur today, three of the biggest malls actually belong to the Kukis. Three of the biggest? Malls. Malls. Yeah. And then they are where? Where are they located? In Imphal. In Imphal yes, itself. Yes, in Imphal. Yes. And uh, there is a lot of hard burn amongst the Meites when they see these huge structures. And when, on the other hand, uh, there's a claim that, uh, you know, tribals and so on and so forth. Okay. You know, in the media, we often don't know what is true, what is half true, what is false. Mm -hmm. One of the claims that has been made is that in the hills of Manipur are very valuable minerals. Minerals that are very, very valuable. And there are attempts being made to get these minerals, I mean, or, or to give the rights or leases to these tracts of land for business houses, business groups to extract minerals. And simultaneously, there is also uh, a plan. The government of India has a plan to have palm oil, palm oil. cultivation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in these hills. Mm -hmm. and, and the agroclimatic zone is such mm -hmm. that you can actually grow palm oil. But those, these are both very, very contentious and controversial issues because palm oil cultivation is monoculture and you, you, you don't have the... Uh, the no, we cannot, we cannot have any monoculture. The northeast region of India is a culturally biodiverse hotspot, perhaps the last surviving one. In the you, world? Yeah, for you still have uh, the hillock gibbons in some areas, you know, they are a diminishing species. And Nagaland was told to give about 10,000 hectares of land uh, for uh, palm oil cultivation recently. We had started a kind of a protest, a discussion that it should not happen because Mizoram had done palm oil cultivation and faced very severe consequences because palm oil uh, takes in a lot of water and we cannot have that happening. Any, in any case, monoculture is bad for the environment and we are a biodiversity hotspot. So 
it should not have even been contemplated in the first place. They wanted to bring it to Meghalaya also, uh, but the government said we have not yet, you know, uh, decided on okay. anything. In Manipur, there are allegations that uh, government is pushing, and and the central government is pushing for these. Yeah, they have a plan. They, they, they have a plan, and, and plan also, to... if you look at the latest um, modification to the Forest Conservation Act, where they say that within a hundred meters of any international border, there will be a lot of development, which means all the forests will go. Absolutely. Yeah, because in so the you, north... you're aware that. Uh, the Assembly of Mizoram mm -hmm. have completely rejected yes, the yes. amendment to the FCA, the Forest, yeah. Forest, 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 Forest Conservation, Conservation Act, but that has not happened in Manipur. No, see, the, the thing again is that we are divided as a region, you see. We should have made common cause on this because this is going to affect us very badly. Many states and not just no, only one state. All, all, 90, 99% of our borders are with foreign countries, just 1% with India. All right. Just that siliguri that, that, that land, chicken's, yeah, chicken's neck. neck. Okay, yeah. let me come back to this other point. On the, you've talked about palm oil. What about the, the mineral, minerals, mineral yeah. rights? Mm. So mining ag rights again, for again, we are hearing a lot about some rare minerals being found in the hills of Manipur, and that you know you want the Adani's of the world to come there and and uh, and harvest oh, all why, that. I mean, uh, we have been hearing this, but there is no evidence. No, there is no Whether evidence. It's Adani or Godrej or, or, or anyone, or anyone. Anybody. Yeah, it could be anyone. It could be any. You know, it could be a multinational from somewhere. Also, you you'll never know that. Recently, they said that iridium. I don't know what iridium is. That also is found in Manipur, and that was told to us by. A cookie gentleman from there. Uh, now all these are in the realm of speculation. What we need to do is really try and hammer down on one or two things and and find out the realities. You know, we have to sort of see that these allegations are actually very factual. All right, and and not just people yeah. talking in the yeah. air. Let me come to a point which I believe is very very important. It seems that the women of Manipur have been the biggest victims and they have been caught in the crossfire of yeah. the civil war, this ethnic war and the rest of India woke up rather belatedly when I think at least two months after the incident had happened, we saw this video mm -hmm. of two women, a middle-aged woman, a young woman being stripped naked in full public mm -hmm. and allegedly gang raped. One of them. One of them. Mm -hmm. Now, this horrifying video, which spread all across the social media, suddenly, as if, aroused the conscience yes. of the nation. And yes. they said, look what's happening. Mm -hmm. That actually brought Manipur into the forefront, because otherwise it was very peripheral reportage, you know. So many killed, so many this, so many that, so many people have been uh, uh, sort of, uh, what should I say? They, they, they are in relief in, camps. In relief camps and not getting so enough many, so food many and medicines. You know, they, uh, we were repeating the figures, almost about 160 killed, about 70,000 displaced and all that. But it, it became a sort of rhetoric until this thing surfaced. And then we realized that uh, this is brutality of the worst kind that you didn't expect in a state so distant from everywhere else. You know, how could people be so murderous? How could someone film that in the first place? That it came out and... And then it was uh, available? Yeah, it was whole available, world watched yes. It. Yeah, so, but at least that it came out, some more attention was given to Manipur. And yet, the Prime Minister of this country has just refused to say a word on Manipur. One minute here. Let me now come to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. You recall that after this video went public, mm -hmm. he, on the not inside parliament, but outside parliament, he condemned it. I mean, his uh, statement was just a little over half a minute, yeah. about 35 seconds. He, at the same time, he said that we should condemn these kinds of acts or violence against women wherever it happens. 
And he mentioned two states. Rajasthan. He's Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh. And these happen to be two states and are which going are going to go polls, for elections. Yeah. Also, mm-hmm. Mizoram is one of them. Mm-hmm. There is also Madhya Pradesh mm-hmm. and, and Telangana. Yeah. But after that, as you know, mm-hmm. there was a huge hue and cry. And the parliament, the monsoon session of parliament, yeah. was absolutely paralyzed because the opposition said, we want the prime minister to speak. Yeah. And finally, the no confidence motion was moved. Yes. And though the no confidence motion, everybody knew that the numbers were in favor of the yeah. government, both yeah. in the Lok Sabha and in the Raj Sabha, yes. this became a means of getting the prime minister to speak. speak yeah. And then the prime minister spoke. He spoke for around two hours and two 15 hours, minutes. Yes. But only a small part of his speech, towards the end of the speech, did he mention Manipur. Patricia, how would you analyze the statements of Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Manipur? I mean, he has not visited that place. The Home Minister, Mr. Amit Shah, has. Though the same Prime Minister before the 2022 State Assembly elections had visited Manipur several times. So, so how, 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 do you, how would you um, comment on and analyze uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Narendra Modi and, and his reactions to what is happening in Manipur? In the first place, I'd like to say that it's very difficult to understand Mr. Modi because during elections, even in the Meghalaya elections, he came several times. He even went to Garu Hills, which is a bit distant. And uh, he doesn't mind actually going to different places where there are elections. And the people of Manipur, you know, whatever you may say about them, they, in their hearts, they're quite simple, especially the Kuki people. They're saying, we elected so many BJP MLAs, but what has happened today? We are, you know, we don't figure in their scheme of things. So we feel orphaned. They've said this many times, we feel orphaned. And when he did his 100th monkey bath, they threw their radios and their transistors away. They said, we don't want to listen to anything. So that is the kind of heartache that the people of Manipur had. And that includes both the hills and the valleys. Okay. The hill and the valley people. You know, a lot of people like me, wonder, why is N. Biren Singh so important for Mr. Narendra Modi? I mean, why, why? What is the logic for not declaring president's President rule? rule. And, and saying, Mr. Biren Singh, you've not been able to control the violence, the situation that has been going on for several months. So we are imposing president's rule and then it's up to the armed forces, it's up to the military to, to try and, you know, stop the violence and bring a semblance of, of normality to what has happened. I've not been able to figure out why the Prime Minister has not done this. Uh, firstly, it is Biren Singh who delivered Manipur to the BJP two times, no? twice uh, in succession. The second time in 2022. Yeah. And, and with a very substantial yes, majority. majority, yeah. Uh, they are unsure that anyone else can do that because he has a, a rival in uh, Biswajit Singh. Biswajit Singh had ambitions of becoming chief minister. He's been applying for that post. But uh, they decided that Biren Singh was their man. They probably assessed his strengths and they have that advisor to the chief minister. I think the party here in Delhi is well briefed as to who to trust, who not to trust, who will be able to deliver uh, the state for the BJP, who will be able to get both those MPs elected, you know, BJP MPs elected in 2024, because they'll need all the numbers. Patricia, explain for the benefit of the viewers of this program, Article 355, Article 356 of the Constitution of India and how they are relevant for what is happening in Manipur at present. Uh, The moment the violence uh, surfaced on the 3rd of May and I think by the 5th of May, it was, uh, we were told, at least we were told verbally that 355 was going to be implemented or enforced in Manipur. 
355 means that law and order will be under the control of the central government. It is akin to president's rule. Uh, no, the next no. step is 356. 356, yes. which is president's yes, rule. Yes, president's rule. There was a press conference and the former DGP who was removed, you know, he was sitting here. This gentleman was sitting here and then the former DGP said, now uh, Article 355 has been enforced in Manipur, so law and order will be under the aegis of the Home Ministry. Then uh, this gentleman, the security advisor, pulled him like that, saying, don't say it, or something to that effect, you know. So it means that even that instruction was not given very clearly. It means that those central security forces were sent to Manipur, about 40,000 of them who are there now, with their hands tied because they don't really know what to do. And this must be the, a classic case where the state police are at loggerheads with the central security forces. And the central security forces even had an FIR filed against them by no less than the state police. Where have we ever had such a situation? The unprecedented. Yes, and the state police is known to be you know, hands in glove with their community, the majority community. The Assam rifles have been alleged to be, you know, more in, in favor of the, the tribal community, perhaps because of, uh, you know, many in the, in the Assam rifles perhaps come from that community. We don't know the facts because we haven't done a head count. But whatever is happening in Manipur is, as you said, unprecedented and therefore it will take a lot to disentangle the mess. Okay. Yeah. There is a lot of dissension, not only within the BJP MLAs belonging to the Kukis, who are, who are the Kukis owners, but also the BJP MLAs who owe their, yeah. uh, I mean, who are Metis. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore it's not as if Chief Minister Biryan Singh commands the loyalty of everybody. Mm -hmm. And as you had earlier pointed out, even before, around the time the violence broke out, and even before the violence broke out, MLAs would be going periodically to Delhi yes. to try and convince the, the leadership in Delhi that they should change uh, the chief minister. So, so people are, keep wondering, what is it? Is it a matter of prestige that if Mr. Modi or Mr. Amit Shah tells Mr. Biren Singh to step down, and that it, it's, a, it's become a matter of prestige and, and, and all the hundreds of people who have died, the, the thousands of people who are in relief camps, their fates don't seem to matter. No, it doesn't seem to matter. It does not seem to matter at all. And as of now, those Meite MLAs who were resentful of uh, Mr. Biran Singh, who wanted him uh, to step down, now they have... You know, now the division is so deep that they can't say anything at this point. There, there's a danger to their lives. You saw what happened to Mr. Rajkumar Singh, the Minister of State for External Affairs. He, his he was home, attacked. His, his home, home was, was yeah, vandalized and burnt. And so no one who is a Meite will say a word against Biren Singh. It doesn't suit them at this point of time. Although when you speak to individual Meites, they say, we never voted for BJP, we never voted for, we don't support Biren Singh, but they can't speak up now. Okay. In fact, some of So, so, so they, they are, their dissension is... Suppressed. Uh, ...beneath the surface. Yeah. They don't speak out openly. I want to return to a point that we were discussing earlier, mm -hmm. the violence against women. Now, a lot of people point out that it's not just ethnic violence where the men of both communities have used rape as a weapon against the women of the different communities. Mm -hmm. It has been alleged that a section of the women abetted yes. the violence against women from a different community. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the name of the Mira Paibis, which uh, mm -hmm. literally means the torch-bearing women, and this is a Métis group. Mm -hmm. And these were the same people who not only protested against AFSPA, but also in a dramatic protest, women, they stripped naked yes. uh, to protest against the Assam rifles, uh, uh, the atrocities committed on, 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 on Manorama, Manorama Devi. Manorama Devi. Mm -hmm. So I'm unable to understand the situation. Uh, I thought... Um, irrespective of the community you belong to, women 
uh, would express a certain solid, a, a sort of a gender-based solidarity. solidarity. No, when you have caricatured the other as the enemy, then um, the enemy must be destroyed, must be, you know, uh, be, be treated as a subhuman species. So anything goes. See, uh, the creation of the enemy is so well crafted by, I think, by the extremist, two extremist groups. They have brainwashed uh, a lot of these uh, so-called Mera Pai Bees, who in my, in my, I've done a little study on them when I visited Manipur on several occasions. I asked the educated women whether they are part of the Mera Pai Bees. No, they are not because they said we are very busy. We go to office or we go to teach and when we come back home, we have work to do. These women have to come out every evening and, and you know, carry their their little hammers and uh, beat up on the electric poles to get everyone to come out basically to sort of uh, to guard against drug addicts and alcoholics you know it, it's meant to be a, what should i say a moral guy a moral guardian some sort of a moral guardian of society but this time uh, to me it looks as if women who have been conditioned in patriarchal societies, they act out patriarchy. And I think this is a, a, a very perfect uh, case you know, study. You, you talked about alcoholism and drug addiction. It is common knowledge that Manipur is really part of what is called the Golden, the golden Triangle, triangle mm -hmm. where poppy cultivation is taking place. Mm -hmm. and. We know mm -hmm. that there is a strong linkage between drug trade and the arms trade. Mm -hmm. And we've had several important persons going on record, including a former police officer. She's openly gone on record yeah. saying that the ruling regime and Biren Singh's own uh, people close to him are directly involved in this drug trade. Would you like to comment on this? Uh, narco terrorism has been part of the ecosystem in Manipur. It's not a new thing. Poppy is grown on the other side, Myanmar border, this side as well. On the Nagaland side of, of Myanmar, you know, uh, I mean, in the, in the Ukrul here, the other side is uh, there are Nagas living there. All of them grow poppy. And it's processed either that side or this side. And you have open borders. Yeah, yeah. I mean, open, is like an open yeah, border. An open border, and you have that free movement regime, which is, which is that people from both sides can come within sixteen kilometers of each other's territories. For trade. Yeah. So not for trade because they they are kin. You know, their kinship ties on All both right. sides. All right. So, but, but trade, also trade, has trade. Yeah, trade happens. And trade in in and in, trading in, in more and also. And, agar, agar wood yeah. and among other things. And the and, trade and in Moray. Jade, I was under, I'm not told. Yes, yes, Jade as well. But Jade comes from that from side Myanmar, to this side. That's right. right. Then Myanmar also has rubies <coughs> and other, you know, precious stones. Uh, but even, even before all this happened, if you look at the trade from Moray, it's more informal than formal. There's a small percentage of formal trade. But people are taking a cut. People are making money. Yeah, yeah. And, and they are important people and yes. they are people in power. Of course. You get even uh, watermelons from Burma to come this side. So there's nothing in, in, in the Manipur shops in the Imphal Valley that doesn't come from that route. And mainly, essentially, Chinese goods, no? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me ask you, there is within India a section of people who would like to attribute the problems that are taking place in Manipur at present to what is happening across the border to Myanmar. And, and uh, all kinds of allegations we hear that these are the people who come, they have fomented the violence, they are behind. What are your views on this subject? There are just a few hundreds of them. At, at most, about 2,000 people in Manipur and a substantial number are in Mizoram. But Mizoram is handling it very well. They're keeping them in proper camps uh, with the you know, the explicit understanding that they will be sent back once the situation improves. 
I think too much is made about the illegal uh, immigrants being the cause of the problem. And I, I want to say this. Why is the Solicitor General saying that the bodies in the mall, which are unclaimed, are that of illegal migrants? How this, does this he know that? This is Solicitor General of yes, India. Yes, and he's saying Mehta. that to the Supreme Court. I mean, uh, but does he have any evidence? No, he is just uh, aping out what the state tells him. How can you do that? How do you determine who is a migrant, especially when he's dead? My but last, the, the reason yes. why they, they, these bodies were not claimed is because you the people from the hills can't go to the valley and vice versa. And perhaps uh, what I would like to point out here is also the kind of... Uh, you know, we have come to a situation where Imphal may no longer be a diverse uh, valley, uh, accommodating diverse populations. And this is the ethnic cleansing yes. part of it. Yeah, that that's why it is it is mm -hmm. referred to as ethnic cleansing because the students studying in Manipur University can't go back there. Now they've written to the UGC saying, please give us our students some accommodation in any of the universities in the rest of the country mm -hmm. because we cannot mm -hmm. go back to Manipur University and they also claim that uh, the results have been so manipulated in a certain college where 70 odd uh, students from the hills were studying psychology only 10 passed you know then when the ITLF protested wrote to the Manipur University this is ITLF stands for the tribal indigenous tribal leaders forum, leaders forum. After they wrote that letter of protest, then immediately the results were revised and, and about 40 of them passed. That means there was something... Yes, there, there was, was manipulation, yes, yes. Okay. I, I have actually just um, a few questions left or just two questions really. So, given the prevailing polarization that has taken place, what is likely to happen? in the foreseeable future. We know that, you know the numbers better than I, thousands of people are in relief camps. Essential medicines, I stocks know. of food yeah. and other supplies are coming and going. It's often not available. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a civil war. It's not just an ethnic conflict. It's not just a kind of narco-terrorism or a drug fuel. You have a huge humanitarian yeah, crisis. crisis on your hand. It, it's been more than four months since mm -hmm. uh, the, the violence escalated. It's almost like uh, people from the valley trying to starve the people in the hills because the people in the hills are apparently having rice water, you know, the kanji kind of thing because there's nothing to eat, basically. How much relief can anyone do when about 60,000, 70,000 people are displaced? It's uh, And if you ask me what's the way forward, I really don't know. No one knows. No, no. Um, put yourself in the shoes of the administration. You have, you're a journalist. You're not an administrator. You've been a journalist for the last three and a half decades and longer. What, according to you, needs to be done? Have things reached a stage where there is no uh, reach that point of no return? Or is there some hope that the situation in Manipur would normalize or, or or would would this just keep on going? No, because on on? unless this, these two divided communities agree to come on a common platform, how can you have anything, any peace building exercise happening? And they are not going to come unless Biren Singh is removed. He has become... So, so you believe that's the first thing that it, it's the done. first. It should be and the first thing. And then after that you can yeah, start the process. Yeah, you can start. Because the person responsible for the crisis cannot also be the person who will resolve that crisis, although it should be in that, you know, in that order. But it's not going to happen here because he's seen as too much invested in the other community. Okay. Thank you so much, Patricia, for giving us your valuable time and explaining the situation in Manipur, the terrible situation, the terrible human humanitarian crisis. You've talked about several things. Uh, and I am really grateful that you've given us your time. And the viewers of NewsClick will surely benefit from listening to how you have explained and analyzed the situation. We conclude our interview with senior journalist Patricia Mukhin, 
She's the editor of the Shillong Times, and she's explained why we have this terrible civil war going on in Manipur at present and what needs to be done. This ethnic conflict, the civil war, this narco terrorism, all of that, which is overlapping and above all, the terrible, the terrible things that have been done to the women of that state. Thank you for being with us on this program. Keep watching News Click, subscribe to the channel, click on that button. Thank you very much.